Hey, well, this morning, join me in the Old Testament book of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel. I won't ask when the last time you read something out of there. Uh, you know, it's way back toward the beginning. It doesn't get a whole lot of recognition, but it's a uh, fantastic book to read that I hope maybe uh, looking at today will whet your appetite for it. Uh, speaking of Samuel, does anyone know who Samuel was? Anybody want to take a stab at it? You want to take a guess? What was that? Over the temple? Okay. Okay. Anybody else? You know, he was, one of the, he was the first prophet that Israel had. He was the first prophet, and he anointed the first king over Israel. Who was the first king over Israel? Saul. Saul was. Saul was the first king over Israel. Not Saul that became Paul. That's the guy who comes way later in the New Testament. But uh, Saul was the first king. Hey, well, uh, as you turn in there, uh, it's uh, right after the book of Ruth. I think it's uh, David, Jeremiah, whatever he says. If you can't find it, just look in the table of contents in the front and find the page that it's on. Hey, you know, one advantage about I know when uh, we used to go to Kim's family's church, they all they had the pew Bible. And so, you know, nobody brought their Bible because they had a Bible in the pew. But one advantage of that, Carl, is the preacher would get up and say, turn to page 127. He didn't have to say what book of the Bible it was. So, who knows? We can't have pew Bibles. We don't have a pew. But anyway, 1 Samuel. Before we read here just a second, uh, how many of y'all like reading or watching about the Old West? Days of the Old West. Hey, you know, a lot of people do. I know Brother Dennis and I do. Uh, he was telling me a couple weeks ago about some new authors that I need to check out. Well, y'all know that I like reading about uh, Louis L'Amour. Well, this last week I was riding with Mr. L'Amour, with uh, Dave Betts, Kill Kenny, Miss Rita, you know, and all the rest of the gang, uh, riding the plains of the old wild, wild west. I was just wondering, how many of y'all think you would like to have lived back then? You know, when gunslingers terrorized the cities and old cowpokes, you know, were... Uh, herding cattle all out in the wilderness. Any of y'all think y'all like to live back then? I wouldn't. Man, get exactly. That's right. Forget it. You can have it. I said one time, one somebody asked my dad. We were visiting a nursing home, and they said something about boy. Hold on. I wish we could go back to the good old days. He didn't say nothing, but when we got in the car, he said, Drew, I'm 80 something years old. They have the good old days. He said, I like turning the heat up, not chopping wood. I like getting in the shower, not being the last one in the tub on Saturday. So, you know, they romanticize it so much. It looks like it'd be fun, but, you know, it'd be a whole lot of trouble. Well, today, who's willing to go riding the range with me? Anybody willing to go riding? Okay. Hey, now, we're not going to ride the range of the Old West, but instead, we're going to ride the wilderness of Israel. We're going to ride through the wilderness of of Israel. To be specific, we're going to be in the area of Carmel and a town called Maon, M-A-O-N, Carmel and Maon. And if you want to know where that's at, look in the back of your Bible at the book of maps. You know that's not what it's called. There's just maps in the back, okay? Look for the Dead Sea. You find the Dead Sea? Y'all are looking at me, so you're not looking at the Bible, okay? But you find there's the Dead Sea. Go about, uh, about a third of the way down of the Dead Sea. Look to the left, and there's a city there. It's probably in yours called Hebron. Say Hebron. Hebron. H-E-B-R-O-N. Well, if you see Hebron, about seven miles south of there is where we're going to be roaming today, Okay? So uh, if you want to look it up later or whatever, uh, you can do that. Hey, this is, I'll show off one of my birthday presents. We're fixing to look at a bunch of sheep herders and stuff like that. I thought this was so cool, though. Uh, this came in the mail. Kim didn't show it to me till yesterday. But I was reading, studying again for today, talking about shepherds and stuff. That's what it, that's what it would have looked like back then. That's what they would have. Yeah, where's the like, where's the, Yeah, exactly. Oh, uh, well. It's right there. <laughs> <laughs> hey, but hey, Ron's, uh, Ron, thankfully, he's putting up some pictures of the Judean wilderness. So, you know, there's a shot right there. Now, that's real pretty right there. You got the mountains in the background, pretty flowers growing in the front right there. 
some of the area is not as nice as that, but that's the kind of, yeah, now I love that shot right there. Hey, well, both of these, these are the exact ones I was looking at. But is that it? Okay. <laughs> hey, there's the green right there. And hey, Lance, there's your ball. You hit over. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's right. Hey, well, you know what I always found? I'd go, I'd go golfing with a dozen balls, and I'd come home with about 36. <laughs> and there's, there's some advantage of hitting it in the woods. But you see how a lot of the area, how rough it is on the right-hand side? You know, when you read in the Bible, especially, well, New Testament as well as Old Testament, that's the kind of junk people were walking around in, you know? We don't, get, we don't catch sight of that. But that's the kind of stuff they, they would run the sheep through that. And then they would come across, a, you know, like an oasis, a green spot right there. But I want you to get an idea of the kind of terrain that we're going to be looking at today. So I appreciate Brother Ron putting those up there so you got some kind of idea of where we're going to be today. So let's saddle up. Let's go on an adventure, Miss Peggy, that I've never taken before as we're going to look at just about the whole chapter of 1 Samuel 25. 1 Samuel 25, as we think about the fool, the feisty one, and the female. The fool, the feisty one, and the female. Almighty God, as we look at your holy word right now, God, I pray that as we read this, and as Alistair Begg prays just about every Sunday before he preaches, we pray that this black print will jump off of the white page into our faces and into our hearts. So God, as we read this today, help us to put ourselves wherever we should be in the words that we're about to read. Help us to see ourselves, God, as you see us. And Lord, if we don't like what we see, then help us to be willing to change today. We uh, thank you so much for this time to look at your word. We look forward to it now. What you're going to say to us in the holy name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Hey, so like I said, it's going to be different today, okay? I'm not going to read a passage and then give you three points and a poem at the end and then go home. We're going to read some. We're going to talk about it. Then we're going to read some more. We'll talk about that. You get the point? If you do, say amen. amen. All right, well, here we go. First of all, we're going to see in verses 2 through 6, I mean 2 through 8, uh, matter of fact, I've got six points today, so, you know, I blew this out of the water. But anyway, first of all, we're going to think about shearing time was sharing time. Shearing time is sharing time. And I'm reading from the Holman uh, Christian Standard Bible here. Here we go. It says, now, a man in Mayon had a business in Carmel. And again, you know, pick up on stuff like that. He was a very rich man with 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats and was shearing his sheep in Carmel. Well, the man's name was Nabal and his wife's name, Abigail. The woman was intelligent and beautiful. It could have been any of you ladies that he's talking about here. But the man, a Calebite, was harsh and evil in all his dealings. Well, while David was in the wilderness... Remember, out in the rough part we were looking at, he heard that Nabal was shearing sheep, so David sent ten young men instructing them. Now go up to Carmel, and when you come to Nabal, greet him in my name. In other words, tell him, hey, David sent, sent us. And then say this, long life to you and peace to you, to your family, and to all that is yours. I hear that you are shearing. Now when your shepherds with us were with us, we did not harass them, and nothing of theirs was missing the whole time they were in Carmel. Ask your young men, and they'll tell you. So let my young men find favor with you, for we have come on a feast day. So please give whatever you can afford to your servants and to your son, David. Well, friends, as the story opens here, we're introduced to a guy in verse 3. What's his name? Nabal. Everybody say Nabal. And it's not Nabal, okay? Because I was practicing this morning and I kept saying Nabal. His name was Nabal. And by the way, Nabal means fool. His name means fool. And we're going to see in just a bit. 
if he lives up to that or not. Well, as you saw in verse 2, again, there's a whole lot of detail in this passage. Verse 2, the writer tells us that Nabal was a rich man. He had 3,000 sheep, 1,000 goats. He lived in a city called Maon, which I'm probably not even saying that right, M-A-O-N, but his business was located where? In Carmel. I thought that was so cool, Jamie. I've never read that anywhere else in the Bible. So this dude was like us, y'all. He lived in Maon. He lived out in the suburbs. And so he did just like some of us do. The unfortunate ones that are still working, that is. Hey, Debbie, you know, we get up every day. You don't drive anywhere. You stay home and work. So you're not a good example. Jamie and I, you know, we're still of the less fortunate. But, you know, we get up every day. We get ready. You know, this guy would get ready. He'd fix his coffee. And then he made the three to four mile trip from Mayon into Carmel. Well, there's where his uh, office was located in the city of Carmel. I looked it up, y'all. There are only about 3,000 people live in Carmel now. So I would imagine in Nabal's day, there was probably only several hundred folks living there. But still, Carmel is mentioned many times in the Bible as a thriving business place. Now, it's not Mount Carmel where Elijah killed the, uh, what was it, 650 false prophets. Mount Carmel is way north of where we are today. This is a town called Carmel. So anyway, this dude, you know, he drives into work every day, just like us. I loved it. I've never seen that anywhere in the Bible. So let's think about this guy. He's rich, but he's also mean and nasty. So that's two strikes against him. But he has got something going for him. He don't have three strikes because the third thing the Bible tells us about him is what? Who are we introduced in verse 3? Abigail. Everybody say Abigail. I like the way you said it, Abigail, because that's just how the Bible describes her. Her name means, my father is delighted. And as we look at this lady, you're going to see that any dad would be delighted to have a daughter as wise, intelligent, and beautiful as Abigail was. Again, I love the way the writer even describes her. Says she was intelligent. Not only was she smart, but she was what? Beautiful. Smart and beautiful. Well, here we go, y'all. We're fixing to ride the range. We're over here in the rough area that Ron showed us. And David's band of 600 merry armed men, they had been patrolling the wilderness out there where Nabal's shepherds have been tending to all of his flock. Now, that's a big deal. For, Nab I mean, for David and his armed men, they're out there just going all around the wilderness. And why is that a big deal? I'll tell you. Because out there in the wilderness, where David and his men are protecting the area, there's also marauders, uh, you know, thieves, uh, killers, bandits. They're also out there in the wilderness, away from the city, to see if they can find any defenseless shepherd or anyone else that's traveling through the area that they might rob or even kill. You know, it's kind of like the, uh, the story of the Good Samaritan. You know, the dude was on the road that led down to Jericho, a road full of thieves, bandits, and murderers. The wilderness was kind of like that. Hey, it reminds me, I was telling, uh, telling them at work the other day, uh, we were at one church and a couple of guys, you ever heard of the Appalachian Trail? You know, it starts in Georgia and it ends up in Maine. A couple of the guys at church were going to go the whole way, uh, Miss Ardeth. They got about halfway, called their wives to come pick them up. They said they didn't. They kept encountering nothing but people on the run from the law, uh, people that were trying to rob them, people that were just bumming up, trying to, man, you got any food? You know, you got anything? You know, it was, everybody was on the run that they met. So, you know, it's kind of where David and his guys are. So anyway, uh, David and his men, they're keeping the area safe as these shepherds are out there. Well, David learns that Nabal is shearing his sheep. He's shearing his sheep. Now, when the shearing was done, and I, that's why I asked my daughter to give me this, manners and customs of the Bible. Because without knowing the customs of the Bible, that would have meant nothing to me. But friends, when it was time to shear the sheep, it was a time of great celebration. Because all these sheep were brought in, and as they were sheared and then the wool was sold, it meant payday for all of the shepherds. So it was a big time. 
And it wasn't only a big time for the shepherds, Brother Dennis. It was a big time for everybody in the city, whether you were a shepherd or not, because in the city they threw a citywide party. I'm always talking about citywide parties in the Bible. Who says God's a bore? Amen? Man, they're always throwing parties in the, in the Bible. But it was like a citywide potluck, and everyone was invited to come, whether you brought something or not. Hey, you get this, y'all, too. Check this out. I found out that in Deuteronomy chapter 14 and in Nehemiah chapter 8 that it was to be a time of sharing with everyone. Whether you were a shepherd, whether you had brought something, whether you didn't bring something, everyone was to be invited to the party and given something to, uh, to eat. So for David to go to Nabal and ask him for some kind of payment for his protection... Again, that was a custom of the day. Now, it wasn't like Nabal had hired David and told him, you know, patrol the area, keep it safe for my shepherds. Nabal hadn't hired him, but friends, it was just a custom of the day. You know, like today, we say, you scratch my back, and I'll what? No, you scratch my back, and I'll fall asleep. I'm not scratching your back. But it was basically like that. You know, hey, you scratch my back, David, and I'll do something for you later. So anyway, you know, that's the big deal. That's why David went and asked Nabal for some kind of payment. Hey, and think about this too. You know, if David and his men had not kept that area safe, then Nabal wouldn't have been able to keep all these flocks and to make all of this money. So he owed David a great debt. So that's the first thing. Number two, let's see the fool's reply. Let's see if he lives up to his name. And we see this in verses 9 through 13. And again, picture in your head that you were there. Verse 9, it says, Now David's young men went and said all these things. In other words, they went and did just what David said. They said it to Nabal on David's behalf, and then they waited. Nabal asked them, Who is this David? Who is Jesse's son? So that right there tells you he knows who David is because he knows his daddy. But anyway... Many slaves these days are running away from their masters. In other words, it's an insult. He's saying David's nothing but a runaway. He's a renegade. Am I supposed to take my bread, my water, and my meat that I butchered for my shearers and give them to men who are from I don't know where? So David's men retraced their steps. In other words, they went back to David. And when they returned to him... They reported all these words. So David said to the men, Well, let's give the guy a break, and maybe next time he'll pay us back after we help him. No, what did David say? This was the guy that's going to go on to write almost all of the Psalms. This is the guy that went on to be the second king of Israel, the greatest king Israel ever had. Friends, this is the guy that God said is a man after my own heart. David said this, Every one of you, get on your sword. In other words, load your guns. Get on your sword. So David and all his men put on their swords. About 400 men followed David, while 200 stayed back with the supplies. So here we go, y'all. Ten of David's men, they go to downtown Carmel, go down Main Street, over here on B Street, and they find Nabal's office over there. You know, so they all go in. They went in and they asked the secretary sitting there, hey, can we speak with Nabal? And she said, you got an appointment? No, we don't have an appointment, but we do have some business uh, with your boss there. She says, well, just wait right here and I'll go see. So they're sitting there. I can see Miss Cheryl in the Cedar Plank lobby, you know, reading the highlights, the magazine <laughs> over there. They're just sitting there doing what people would do when they go to the office. The lady goes in and says to Nabal, her boss, hey, you know, these guys out here want to talk to you. And it's interesting that the Bible points out, it says they made their request and they waited. He made them sit out in the lobby and sweat. Finally, the guy, I can picture him right now. I bet he looked just like, who's that guy? C Fields, what's the dude? C.W. Fields or whatever, the fat guy, always had a cigar in his mouth. I picture him being just like that guy. He comes out there chewing on a cigar and he comes out there with his response. Now, he knows what the guys are here for. Let's think of Nabal's options right here. First of all, 
He can send the men back to David with a word of thanks and appreciation and a big old fat check, or that day would have been a bag full of gold. He could have sent him back with a great thank you, man, I'd have never done it without you. Or secondly, Miss Sandy, he could send them back with, you know, maybe a few dollars, not a whole lot. He could send them back with a little bit, you know, and a not so gracious thank you, but at least he would send them back with something. Or number three, he could just flat out insult the guys, tell them they're a bunch of runaway slaves and renegades, and then he could have said to them, who is this David guy that I should give him anything? And then get out of my office. So he had those three options. Now, which one did the fool choose? Number three. That's right, Brother Ken. To his demise, he chose number three. And like I've made a reference to, in his response, not only does Nabal send them away with absolutely nothing, but he insults David and the whole group in the process. You know, basically, to use our modern vernacular, Nabal stood there and looked at these guys with a smart aleck look on his face, and he said, who do you think you are coming in my office and want my money that I didn't even ask you to do? Get out of here and don't come back. Now, David's men, they go back with nothing. I can just see it now. David and the other, you know, they're sitting there. They said there's 600 of them all together. Ten of them went away, so there's 590 of them sitting there waiting for something. And I can just picture it now. They see the ten. They're riding down the hill right now. You saw the wilderness like it is. As they're coming down the trail, the smoke, the dust is going up. You know, just like Louis Lemoore would have wrote the whole scene. And they're thinking, man, here we go. We're going to all get paid. And they wheel up there and they stop. and have nothing. And then they tell David what Nabal said to him. And friends, David flipped out. He completely lost his cool. And what did he say? Everybody, get your sword on. I can imagine he was sitting there. They had a little fire going. You know, they were probably chewing on lamb jerky or something, whatever, doing what guys would have done. And he jumps up from where he is, and he sticks his sword in his belt. Everybody, get your sword ready. And as he runs to his, I don't know what they were riding, horses, camels, you know, donkeys, I don't know what they had, but whatever they drove back then. And he shouts to all his guys, let me tell you something. Nabal is going to pay us, buddies. He's going to pay us. But you know what? It may not be with money. He's going to pay us in blood. He is going to pay us in blood. You know, David's talking. He says, after all we've done for this fool, and this is the thanks I get. Number three, introduce and I kept saying heroin. It's not heroin. How do you say a female hero? Heroin? That's how you say it? Okay, she's not shooting up. You know, oh, there you go. That's how you say it. Heroin. I don't know. Anyway, the lady that saves the day. In verses 14 through 17. So are y'all ticked off? Are you out there with David? You've been working for nothing, Debbie. You've been out there in the wilderness protecting this clown's sheep. And he's going to make fun of you, ridicule you? Are y'all mad? Yes. You don't look like it. You don't sound like it either. I'm mad. Verses 14 through 7. What did he say? I thought I heard Randy say something. <laughs> so anyway. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, okay. Hey, anybody packing heat? Here we go. Verse 14. One of Nabal's young men informed Abigail, Nabal's wife, Look, David sent messengers from the wilderness to greet our master, but he yelled at them. I love it. He yelled at them. The men treated us well. When we were in the field, we weren't harassed. Nothing of ours was missing the whole time we were living among them. They were a wall about us. And both, not just sometime, but both day and night. The entire time we were herding the sheep. Now, Abigail, carefully consider what you must do because there is certain to be trouble for our master and his entire family. And then what is this guy? How does he wrap it up? He is such a worthless fool that nobody can talk to him. 
One of the guys working in Nabal's office, he observed the encounter between David's men and his hateful boss. This young guy knows how much David protected Nabal's men and flocks when they were out there. He knows how offensive Nabal's response is going to be to David. And he knows that if something isn't done quickly, that there is going to be heck to pay. He knows trouble is on the way. So the office boy, it's interesting, Diane, he doesn't even go to Nabal. He doesn't even try to reason because he even said he's such a worthless fool. You can't even talk to him. He doesn't waste his time talking to Nabal. But instead, he runs to Abigail and he makes her aware of the situation. And this is interesting to me that he doesn't ever tell Abigail what she should do. He just simply goes to her and relays the facts. He trusts her to do what's right. So let's see what Ms. Abigail's going to do. Down at verse 18 through 22. I mean, man, this would make a great movie or something. Abigail hurried, taking 200 loaves of bread, two skins of wine, five butchered sheep, a bushel of roasted grain, 100 clusters of raisins, and 200 cakes of pressed figs. Let me tell you something. She had a heck of a pantry, didn't she? Y'all think y'all don't have enough cabinet space? This lady must have had a kitchen that was out of sight. I mean, she had all this stuff on hand. She just ran around and gathered it up right quick, you know? It's crazy. So she's got all this stuff, loaded it on donkeys. How many donkeys do you think that took? Holy cow, there's a, there's a train of them heading out that way. Then she said to her male servants, You go ahead of me, and I'll be right behind you. But she did not tell her husband, Nabal, or you could say she didn't tell her husband, the fool. As she rode the donkey down a mountain pass hidden from view, she saw David and his men coming toward her, and she met them. And check it out. Isn't it interesting? This, this is so funny to me. David had just said, I guarded everything that belonged to this man in the wilderness for nothing. He wasn't missing a thing, yet he paid me back evil for good. May God punish me and even more if I let any of his men survive until the morning. So as David is mulling over in his head what has happened, who does God put in his pathway? Abigail. Let me tell you, friends, there's no such thing as coincidence. Amen? There's providence. I don't believe in coincidence. Abigail didn't ask Nabal. She didn't inform him about what she was going to do. So what does that tell you? She knows what a fool she's been married to. And you may be thinking, if, he, if she was beautiful, if she was intelligent, why did she ever hook up with his clown? Are you wondering that? Okay, I was wondering it too, Miss Linda. Do you ladies ever wonder why y'all hooked up with us? I don't answer that. Once again, friends, I found out why she would have done that because they had mostly prearranged weddings in that day. Man, wasn't that a stunk? You know, some countries still do that. You know, you're going to marry so-and-so, and I've never even seen her, whatever. But that's why she was even hooked up with this guy to start with. So she acts quickly, she gathers up all this generous amount of food, and she sends it on ahead of her, with her servants. Once again, it shows how smart she is. Because before they encounter Abigail, David and his men see all this food and all this stuff coming at them. She tells the servants, go quickly, speed is of the essence. David is on his way, and he is determined to kill every male he encounters at Nabal's house including Nabal himself. Well, having sent the food on ahead, Abigail, the Bible, she's making her way down the mountain. And isn't it so cool that she sees David and he don't see her? So she can position herself just right. I can see it just now. Again, as verse 27 said, David is still grumbling. Don't you get sick and tired of people that just grumble all the time? 
Man, I got people I work with, they're always griping about what the boss did three days ago. I want to say, what you just be quiet. Just get over it, man. It's done. It's in the past. Quit griping. Get on with life. David, I bet all these guys, they're probably starting to kind of drift behind him because they're sick of him talking about, Nabal did this, Nabal did that. You wait till like, you know, they're sick of hearing it. He's going over this in his mind. He comes around the corner, and there, the Bible says, kneeling in the middle of the road is Abigail. Kneeling in the middle of the road <laughs> is Abigail. I'm telling you, she was smart. She is smart. She's bowed there in the middle of the road. Okay, so we've seen what's happened so far. Let's see how Abigail's plan, how it prevails. And we see that starting in verse 23. So when Abigail saw David, she quickly got off the donkey, fell with her face to the ground in front of David. She fell at his feet and said, The guilt is mine, my Lord, but please let your servant speak to you directly. Holy cow. Man, Nabal, he definitely married up. I mean, she's blaming herself for his foolishness. She says, well, please, you know, it's all my fault, but please just, just listen to me. Just hear me out. My Lord should pay no attention to this worthless man, Nabal, for he lives up to his name. His name is Nabal? And I didn't say this, boys, the Bible does, and stupidity is all he knows, okay? I, your servant, didn't see my Lord's young men who you sent, now, my Lord, as surely as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, it is the Lord who kept you from participating in bloodshed and avenging yourself by your own hand. May your enemies and those who want trouble for my Lord be like Nabal. Please accept this gift your servant has brought to my Lord and let it be given to the young men who follow my Lord. She just keeps pumping this guy up, right? She keeps pumping him up. Please forgive your servant's offense, for the Lord is certain to make a lasting dynasty for my Lord. Jump down to verse 32 through 35. So you see what Abigail is proposing. Please forgive us. We've acted foolishly. Please take these gifts and don't do what you have planned to do. Then David said to Abigail, Praise to the Lord God of Israel who sent you to meet me today. Blessed is your discernment and blessed are you. Today you kept me from participating in bloodshed and avenging myself by my own hand. Otherwise, as surely as the Lord God of Israel lives who prevented me from harming you, if you had not come quickly to meet me, Nabal wouldn't have had any men left by morning light. Then David accepted what she had brought him and said, Go home in peace. See, I have heard what you said, and I have granted your request. Abigail succeeded in convincing David not to kill Nabal. David, look, it's not going to be worth the effort. He's a fool. Don't waste your time with it. Even more, David is going to give you a reputation that you will never be able to live down, and it will put a guilt on you that you will carry the rest of your life. So, friends, we see her wisdom revealed here in that she builds David up. She offers an apology, but also wrapped up in the sweetness of all of that, are some hard words that David needed to hear. Because not only did she ask for forgiveness, but she also said to David, don't do this. You are killing, you are taking judgment into your own hands. You should leave vengeance unto God. You are going to kill innocent people in the process. David, you better not do this or you're going to regret it the rest of your life. It's so cool how she did that. Now, what do you call that? Not a backhanded compliment, but I can't remember. I don't know what you call it. Who cares? But anyway, you know, she buttered him up. And while he's thinking he's the king of the world, she tells him, if you do this, you're going to regret it. David is moved by her words, abandons his plans to kill Nabal. He, 
he even went on to thank Abigail for what she did. And I love it. He said, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel who brought you to me today, and blessed be you as well. All right, let's see the folly of the fool. How many of y'all like happy endings? I get sick of them going to the movies. I always end happy. Give me something real life, man. But anyway, the folly of the fool, verses 36 through 39. I wonder how many times Abigail played this scene through her life, what we're fixing to see. Abigail went to Nabal, and there he was in his house. Feasting like a king, Nabal was in a good mood and what? Very drunk. I wonder how many times she had to come home and put his slobbering, sorry self in the bed. She didn't say anything to him until morning light. Oh, but in the morning, when Nabal sobered up, his wife told him about all these events. Then he had a seizure and became paralyzed. About 30 days later, the Lord struck Nabal dead. So when David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Praise the Lord who championed my cause against Nabal's insults and restrained his servant from doing evil. How many times have I prayed this next sentence? on somebody. You can call me wrong for doing it, but who in here hadn't thought this? The Lord brought Nabal's evil deeds down on his head. Who in here hadn't wanted God to bring somebody down for what they did to you and me? Completely oblivious to the stupidity of his actions. Completely oblivious, Brother Jim, to how close he came to death. Nabal is home feasting like a king. I can see him now, Brother King. He's got a big old lamb leg eating. He's got it all over his face. He says he's drunk. Bring me another beer. You know, his food slobbering all over the place. A pig. I think he was a pig. He's drunk, when she, so she wisely says nothing to the fool. Why should she? You think it'd do any good? Can you reason with somebody that's plastered, that's out of their mind? She says nothing. But the next morning, it says when Nabal sobered up, over breakfast, Abigail's pouring his coffee. And she says, darling, let me tell you, what happened yesterday. Let me tell you about the events of yesterday. And as Nabal hears what all took place, I can see it now, Randy, the color drained from his face. He dropped his fork full of eggs, and then the Bible says, bam, just like that. He became paralyzed. I think he had a stroke out of fear. I think he had a stroke out of fear. And then 10 days later, what happened to him? He's dead. He's dead. Hey, as one commentator I read said, listen to this, quote, 10 days later, the Lord struck Nabal dead. How much better that this fool died at God's hands than at the hand of David. End quote. Sound like something Louis L'Amour wrote, didn't it? <laughs> Except it would have been in Israel. It wouldn't have been here in Colorado. I got three quick lessons for life. This stuff just jumped out at me. I hope God tells, shares you something else. The first thing I see out of this, Ron, is this, is that we should be quick to curb our anger. Be quick. To curb your anger. James 1, 19 and 20 says this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak. Hey, and I never thought about this before. Again, because somebody, I didn't pick up on it. It had to be somebody smarter than me. But have you ever noticed how the words listen and silent 
are spelt with the same letters? Is that cool or what? A light bulb went off in my head. Because you know what? You can't do one without the other. You have to be quiet in order to listen. Amen? But you know what? Even if we're not saying it with our mouth, when somebody's talking to us, what are we doing? The gears are screaming. Usually screaming so loud we can't hear what somebody's saying to us. Anyway, you got to be quiet to hear what somebody's saying. James, he says, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. For man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Proverbs 14, 16 says this, that a wise man fears the Lord and shuns evil, but a fool is hot-headed and reckless. Hey, that sounds, that described David perfect, didn't it? He was hot-headed, he was reckless, he was foolish. Isn't that amazing that his son wrote that later? Maybe he observed his daddy. Who knows? Then Ecclesiastes 7, 9 says this, Don't let your spirit rush to be angry, for anger abides in the heart of a fool. Well, I tell you what, I had to eat these words all week. You'll probably tell by the way I beat on the pulpit, I can get angry. And I had to really talk to myself this week. Curb your anger, Drew. You know why? we we'll never forget this, friends. How do you spell anger? How come all I hear is women? <laughs> hey, guys, because y'all are wise and intelligent and beautiful. We're foolish and stupid and drunk. No, I ain't. I don't know what you do in the evening. Hey, guys, how do you spell anger? How do you spell danger? One letter separates anger from danger. Remember that the next time you want to explode. Hey, somebody went to the great Charles Spurgeon one time. It was a lady, as the story goes. She went to the great Charles Spurgeon one time. Evidently, he had preached on anger or something. And she said, uh, Reverend Spurgeon, you know, I don't, I don't hold a grudge. I don't, you know, I, I, I don't stay angry. I don't stay angry. She says, I just go and explode on somebody that I'm angry at and then walk away. <laughs> he said, Madam, let me ask you this. Suppose you were a shotgun and you went off on somebody and walked away. What kind of what, what, how did he put it? What kind of mess would you have left? You would have blown that person away and killed them. What he was saying was, it's just as foolish to go blow up on somebody in your anger and then walk away. Be quick to curb your anger. Be quick to wrap up the sermon, right? Be quick to listen to godly advice. Be quick to listen to, hey, when confronted by Abigail, what choices did David have? Y'all tell me. What could David have done? Who wants to guess? He kept on. Do what? He could have kept on going. Exactly. He could have... That's the very first thing I thought of, Ms. Cheryl. He could have ignored her. Let me tell you, especially in a day when ladies were seen as unimportant. Y'all were just a side note. Y'all were here to make my life pleasurable in every kind of way. That's what God puts you here for, you know. I'm the guy. You're the girl, you know. You'll speak when I ask you to speak. Oh, that's the kind of world it was. So here comes this woman. David has no idea. He never even met her before. And she basically, you know, tells him, uh, you better stop what you're doing. And he's got 599 guys behind him, all with swords in their hand, you know, giving David advice. Get out of my way. Who do you think you are talking to me like that? Hey, now, Lance, the fact that Abigail was a knockout, you know, that didn't hurt her cause either, any. You know, I, hey, I'm a guy, so, Tom, I couldn't help but think, if David had rode up, and I'll be politically correct, if there was a portly, homely woman bowed in the middle of the street, would he have just looked at her as he rode on by? 
Would he have paid her any mind at all? No, but here's this fox kneeling in the middle of the street. He's a hot-blooded guy. He's going to stop and say, what in the world? What is the Lord given to me? Of course, he stops and sees what's going on. He could have ignored her. Number two, he could have listened to her advice. Thank God he did the second. And don't forget, he did this in front of 600 men. Proverbs 10, 17 says, The one who follows instruction is on the path to life, but the one who rejects correction will certainly go astray. And then Proverbs 1, 5 says, A wise man will listen and will increase his learning. Then number three, last thing, get out of here. Be quick to let God settle your accounts. Hey, you know, Abigail even said it. She said, David, you're taking matters into your own hands here. You need to just back off and let God take care of it. Hey, and did God take care of it? What did God do to Nabal? He killed the foolish guy. He killed him. You know, it reminds me of Romans chapter 12, where the writer there says, Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Hey, you know what? I can read that a thousand times a day. It's easy to read. It's easy to say. But it ain't easy to do. Hey, wrapping it up with some lingo from Louis L'Amour. Abigail headed David off at the pass. She headed him off at the pass just as he was about to plot his vengeance. So friends, here I see we see God's providence in the timing here. Hey, and praise God for all the times when we're about to do something foolish and God in his providence intervenes and he saves us from ourselves. Almighty God, thank you so much for your holy, blessed word. May you take today what we have looked at, apply it to our hearts, apply it to our lives. In the holy name of Jesus, I pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Hey, it'd be time for the offertory as Tom plays and we sing. Put your offering in the box. This is a song I learned also 20 years ago, and it has a different counting. Maybe after I play it once, we can sing it through together. It's called Honor and Glory Forever. How many want to either be entertained for three minutes or worship? Worship. Well, you know, I looked up the word entertainment, and it says anything that will hold or keep one's attention. So maybe we could do both. (laughs) To the King Eternal. Forever and ever. To the King The only God Be the honor and glory Try to sing this to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be the honor and glory forever and ever. To the King.
Amen.